Uh, good morning uh, and welcome. Uh, this is Jody Giovanni from uh, Birmingham, Leicester in the UK. Uh, I've been uh, honoured to uh, give the uh, Gert Hausdorff lecture on behalf of the Working Group on Intervention, and I'm very grateful to them and to AEPC and the organisers for supporting this. The title is uh, The Heart and Art, and I will explain the connection. But uh, there is no doubt the heart is an inspirational organ, both for artists, engineers, and for us uh, interventionists. The uh, link uh, with art uh, was in uh, 2001, when there was the World Congress in Toronto, and uh, many members of the APC uh, would have been uh, present uh, at that, uh, a good meeting it was as well. And um, on uh, one occasion, I decided to stray away from the meeting uh, to go to the Art Gallery of Ontario, which is a modern, uh, very inspirational uh, architecturally uh, building, which houses really some very uh, good uh, um, paintings, sculptures, and uh, uh, other exhibits. The uh, bronze. Uh, um, statue that you can see in the top right may resemble uh, Thomas Kreisman, but uh, I can reassure that it's not him. It's uh, actually uh, the thinker by uh, the French sculptor uh, Rodin. Whilst uh, I was in uh, one of the rooms, uh, I uh, um, saw Gert Hausdorff, whom I had met before, but we were always kind of professional talking about interventions and all that uh, stuff. But he gave me a very big smile. Clearly, he was much more relaxed. We shook hands, started talking about art, and we decided to go around together uh, uh, in the gallery. And it was a really a very pleasant day. Gerd was uh, born in uh, Germany, and uh, he uh, had some uh, assignments uh, in very good centers like the German Heart Center and the Charité in Berlin. He then became a professor in uh, Hanover. But due to reorganization uh, in the mid 2001, uh, he uh, went to uh, Nottingham, uh, to Gottingen. And uh, uh, unfortunately, about four months after uh, the World Congress, um, he died. He was only 48, uh, 49, and uh, he uh, apparently collapsed in the garden, possibly from a heart attack, and passed away. Huge tragedy, both for the profession uh, as well as for the family. Uh, talking to uh, colleagues and uh, trainees, uh, they had a very high uh, uh, impression of him. Uh, they described him as a, a visionary uh, with always good ideas, some good, some bad, but he was able to decipher which were the good ones to pursue. He was enthusiastic, apparently a workaholic, and you can understand that. And he started with in contributions to intensive care and ultrasound, but uh, in the early 90s, uh, he concentrated on intervention. Uh, his uh, colleagues say not always easy to work with, and this doesn't mean that he was uh, evil or, or bad. It's just that he was uh, very focused and very committed. And uh, <clears throat> once he uh, thought about an idea, worked it all out, he felt very sure that that was the right way forward. However, uh, at the back uh, of all this, uh, he always had the patient's uh, best interest at heart. Uh, one of the early interventions that he got involved with was ASD closure, uh, and uh, this uh, largely happened with the uh, uh, development of the Rashkind PDA device, which eventually became the Starplex. Uh, and uh, not only was he a very good implanter and uh, learned and taught a lot, but he also ran uh, animal laboratories, uh, wet laboratories, um, to uh, uh, train people how to do it, how to retrieve them, and so on and so forth. Uh, on the top right, uh, you can see um, two very well-known interventionists, Jim Locke and uh, Shaq Qureshi. Uh, they're, all, they're both very focused. God knows what they are looking at, but they really can't uh, move their gaze at all. Shaq is very relaxed. You know, his head is a little bit back, whereas Jim is just looking forward like a, 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 a bird of prey. Uh, and uh, you can see that he's also a little bit tense because his jugular is up. It transpired that they were uh, trying to uh, look and find out where the Starflex was. It actually fell on the floor, but someone uh, uh, managed to put it on the table uh, eventually. 
the uh, group, uh, and uh, Gert was quite uh, uh, instrumental in this, uh, recruited uh, very enthusiastic people, and uh, uh, you will know many of these, uh, maybe starting from the left, Lara Latson, uh, Piesho, uh, Jim Locke, uh, then there is um, uh, Gert of himself, Be below is Lee Benson, John Hess, Shaq, uh, Evan Zahn, Mario Carminati, Bill Harenbrand, and uh, um, Mike Rigby amongst uh, those very important people. The heart uh, uh, became uh, uh, an organ of uh, symbolism and uh, iconography. And uh, this is for a number of uh, reasons, not just because it was a pump and a complex pump. But there were myths, you know, uh, such as the Egyptians uh, uh, thinking that uh, the wisdom and the soul were uh, in the heart, which clearly was uh, not true. They elevated the heart above the brain uh, in that context, and that was not uh, uh, correct. Um, there were also uh, misconceptions about uh, the uh, uh, function of the heart, uh, how, how it actually worked, what its function was. There were also uh, um, a lot of... Uh, connections with emotions, uh, um, such as uh, uh, happiness, elation, um, sadness, broken heart, and also maybe stone heart. Uh, and these were just uh, nothing to do with the heart as such, it's just that how the human beings uh, related to it. And uh, more recently, perhaps it's been associated more with uh, love, romance, religious devotion, and uh, very commonly Valentine's Day, on the 14th of February. There are very few uh, prehistoric paintings that uh, depict any organ, because in the prehistoric uh, paintings, usually in caves, they uh, painted the animals that they hunted, the weapons that they used, and the hunters themselves, but never really organs. But in 1908, uh, in Northern Spain, they discovered these paintings, and you can see on the right, the picture of an elephant, and for some reason, there is something which looks like uh, the image of a heart. Now, even in those days, and these people, the Crow Magnon uh, tribe, which were the ancestors of the true Europeans, uh, as opposed to the Neanderthals, uh, they um, uh, somehow uh, depicted the heart the way that we almost do today as a Cupid's heart. It's not clear why they did it or what the intention was, but this seems to be the earliest, and uh, they lived about 10,000 years uh, ago, so that's a long time ago. More recently, and that's 3,000 years ago, the Egyptians uh, depicted the heart as the pharaonic heart. It's uh, not uh, an artistic uh, impression, it's how the heart looks like. And one of the reasons why they depicted it, and uh, largely in, in their paintings and hieroglyphics uh, in the tombs, was uh, the belief that they uh, had to weigh the heart against a feather uh, when uh, one of the pharaohs died. And uh, depending on whether the heart was heavier than the feather or lighter, uh, the uh, person who owned it was either bad or good. Uh, these are uh, largely for uh, uh, religious and cultural uh, reasons, these drawings. But uh, obviously, they have great artistic value and remarkably, after so many thousands of years, a lot of them are still present, well preserved, including their brilliant colors. The uh, Egyptians, however, felt uh, that, uh, again, the uh, soul and the wisdom uh, and personality was in the heart rather than in the brain. And uh, the Greek philo philosophers, such as Hippocrates and Aristotle, pretty much also uh, taught very similarly. However, Pythagoras about 200 years earlier than Aristotle uh, had uh, um, argued that uh, the soul uh, is in the brain and that it is immortal. Uh, Aristotle did some uh, drawings of the heart. These were not really artistic. They were more uh, really for scientific value. They're reasonably accurate, although not completely because he even described the ventricles as being a single ventricle. How the shape of the heart uh, came into existence, we don't know, but on the left, there is the seed of the plant Silphius, which is now uh, extinct. And it does uh, give you the impression of it being uh, uh, like heart. The Silphius plant was uh, extremely popular, 
both as a, as a plant to eat, but also for medicinal values, uh, including contraception and, and aphrodisiac and uh, anything that you can mention. So it's quite uh, conceivable that this uh, um, uh, was used uh, because it was such a popular plant. At some point, um, the pharaohs did remove the heart and uh, there was some uh, talk about the heart uh, maybe producing nasal mucus and therefore it shouldn't be left in the body after burial. So when they did that, they replaced it with amulets, which uh, they carved from uh, special stone. And uh, considering these were done so many years uh, ago, uh, they are um, of high quality and uh, uh, the, the, the stone is clearly quite special. And you can see a couple of these in the uh, Metropolitan Museum in uh, New York. However, as time went by, uh, the uh, Egyptians felt that the mucus was coming from the brain and hence uh, um, uh, when they bury uh, a pharaoh they take the brain out not through a craniotomy but through a hole in the nose. One of the uh, important contributors uh, has been uh, Leonardo da Vinci both in terms of the drawings uh, but also in terms of uh, understanding the heart. Uh, da Vinci was uh, clearly a genius, uh, he was uh, an engineer and he built uh, many uh, um, um, items, including uh, uh, ones for, uh, the, for war, for infrastructure and for industry. He also delved into aviation, both wings and uh, um, vertical flying, helicopters, the or origin of helicopters. He was also a brilliant architect. And also we know that he was a very, very good painter with uh, the Mona Lisa and the uh, Last Supper, which is in the uh, church in uh, Milan, uh, uh, Santa Maria delle Grazie, and it is well worth uh, uh, seeing. In his later life, uh, around when he was around 50, he started uh, putting a lot of effort into drawing the body, including uh, the heart. He did brilliant external as well as internal uh, images of the heart, uh, including details of the valves, but he also looked at function, uh, so he filled the aorta with fluid and there was no leakage, so he assumed uh, that the aortic valve opened uh, when the heart contracted, uh, but then there was no leakage because the valve closed. The most important contribution, however, was uh, on the mitral valve. He described the uh, uh, leaflets and the sub-valve uh, apparatus and also gave an inclination as to uh, how uh, these might uh, work and the uh, surgeons uh, and uh, more recently the interventionists have used all this knowledge to uh, be able to uh, um, reconstruct or repair mitral valves. It also helped uh, William uh, Harvey uh, to uh, work out the circulation in the early 1600s. So the Da Vinci um, did uh, a really very good artistic um, sketches with uh, meaningful implications. He confirmed for definite that it was a four chamber heart. There were different uh, structure and function of the valves for the, the inlet and the outlets, but he also uh, put a lot of effort into the geometry and orientation of the heart muscle, which uh, in turn um, led to how heart function and heart dysfunction uh, operate. He also linked the wrist pulse to the contraction of the left ventricle which was against the uh, uh, belief of Galen a few centuries earlier. And as I mentioned, the mitral valve detail was uh, uh, quite special, very, very useful for the surgeons. And uh, recently um, uh, from uh, uh, London, um, one of the um, uh, radiologists there looked at 25,000 MRIs and uh, um, uh, confirmed quite a lot of the details uh, that Da Vinci described. The pictures of the heart uh, after Da Vinci um, became a little bit more artistic and uh, Sir Robert Carswell, who was a nobleman in the UK, uh, was a very, very, very good uh, um, painter. And as you can see, he now has uh, put the heart in three dimensions with different colors, some of them obviously artificial, both in um, health but also uh, in diseased hearts. 
one of the uh, um, uh, iconic um, images of the heart um, came really through the um, Catholic Church, which was very powerful in Europe uh, um, uh, in, in the uh, 1100s. And um, uh, they came up with the idea of uh, uh, the Sacred Heart, which uh, was a, a symbol of the heart uh, on Jesus. And uh, um, apart from the shape, it also had the flames and the light, um, uh, as well as the sign of the cross. But it was also surrounded by thorns because of the pain that he suffered uh, during the crucifixion. Uh, sometime later, the same was applied to his mother, Mary, and uh, her heart uh, was surrounded by flowers rather than by thorns. But she also had a dagger because she was clearly very hurt uh, with the uh, crucifixion. Uh, Dr. Budijan was a cardiologist in uh, Brussels and he originally came from Armenia and he looked at the uh, um, link between the heart and uh, uh, religion in particular and uh, he produced two books with uh, numerous uh, images um, showing uh, the heart in paintings, sculptures, uh, embroidery, lace, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's quite a, an impressive uh, collection. It's all clear when uh, the heart and uh, love and romance uh, came together, but uh, one uh, assumption was uh, related to the uh, book uh, called Romain de la Croix, uh, and uh, this translates as the romance of the pair. So we can see uh, on the left, uh, charité or charity presenting Jesus with something that looks like a heart but it could equally be a, a, a pair and uh, there is a on the right hand side a, a picture by Giotto uh, in the Scrovegni uh, chapel in Padua which uh, depicts exactly the same thing. More recently we uh, associate the heart with the shape of a cupid's heart and it is used in a number of instances uh, including uh, playing cards, a lot uh, related to Valentine cards, but also uh, nowadays uh, emojis, uh, which we use on a regular basis. Uh, Valentine um, was um, um, uh, executed um, in the four, 400 uh, uh, BC. Um, at the time, the Roman emperor uh, one uh, had decided that soldiers should not uh, marry and uh, Valentine decided to take the soldier's view and he was therefore executed. And uh, the Pope at that time decided to make him a saint and uh, hence Saint Valentine and Valentine's Day. One of the uh, last and very important contributions that uh, Gert Hausdorff did was uh, to uh, uh, finalize a modified fontan through a catheter technique. And this has been uh, taken up by a number of people. It's a successful technique. And uh, people have uh, um, progressed and developed it using modern techniques. And I'm grateful to Dr. Vettikater from Michigan for, for these. He used uh, the CT to um, make a plastic model, then to order a, a prepared uh, stent uh, taking into account how much it shortens with the dilatation required. And then he also uh, used uh, uh, 3D uh, uh, imaging and uh, CT for um, precise placement with an excellent result. Uh, the same or similar idea um, uh, can be used uh, for uh, um, uh, lateral tunnel fontan. This was one where there was a big patch leak, uh, which was uh, improved with a, an Amplatzer device, but not completely. So placing a graft um, scent, uh, similar to what uh, Gert Hausdorff uh, had recommended, uh, did the trick very nicely. Um, uh, we uh, tend to uh, be uh, also innovative in these days. Until recently, uh, uh, superior sinus venosa says these were not uh, treatable um, uh, by catheter, but uh, nowadays um, uh, some of them are uh, amenable and you can see again some similarities to the concept of uh, 
uh, Gert Hausdorff. One of the most important developments over the last 20 years has been uh, percutaneous uh, valves, both the aortic and pulmonary. Um, and uh, you can see uh, a sapient valve in the RV outflow and the valve and valve using the melody in the tricuspid uh, position. And this works extremely well and it saves uh, redo operations in uh, many uh, patients. Uh, however, sometimes the native RV outflow is uh, very wide, so there are different <clears throat> techniques which are being evaluated for uh, uh, placement of uh, a large um, valve um, using reducers or something similar. This is a bioabsorbable uh, large scent, and I'm grateful to Dr. Uh, Damien Kenny from uh, Dublin for these. It is a bioabsorbable uh, stent. It's used for uh, esophageal stricture, and it can be combined uh, with uh, a, a valve, which is made from uh, the patient's own cells, and therefore it's not rejected and hopefully it does not degenerate. Uh, so this is something which is being evaluated and hopefully will be um, commercially um, available to, uh, uh, to, to the interventionists. The uh, major advances have been in relation to repair of the AV valves, uh, particularly the mitral and the tricuspid. Uh, initially, this was a hybrid, but uh, remarkably, these can now be uh, carried out using um, uh, percutaneous techniques, and there are rings as they do also during surgery or similar to the Alfieri technique using the mitral clip and so on. So things have moved on in a very, very, very big way. And there are also valve replacements which can be put in percutaneously in these positions. However, um, uh, sometimes uh, the uh, valve ring is too big, particularly for the tricuspid. And uh, in this situation, um, there are alternatives. Uh, when you have severe tricuspid regurgitation, sometimes you'll end up with severe organ uh, congestion, hepatomegaly, renal dysfunction, and so on, ascites. So one option is to place a valve in this uh, inferior vena cava, but if there are symptoms related to the, um, uh, to the head, to the brain, you can also put um, uh, another valve into the superior vena cava. And as you can see in the last slide, uh, there is uh, hardly any backflow at all, and this uh, improved the congestion in the abdominal organs. So um, I wonder whether you can help me. Um, could someone please help these people? They are still looking at it. They haven't found it. They're still focusing. Anyone who can help them, please let them know. Uh, I'm grateful to uh, Dr. El Hanan Bruckheimer from Tel Aviv, who uh, is uh, doing uh, an excellent job with uh, these uh, holograms, which uh, um, give uh, the uh, surgeon and the interventionist the uh, uh, ability to look at the heart in so many different ways. Uh, and uh, this uh, clearly is extremely helpful uh, in planning and uh, executing interventions and surgery. The uh, um, artists uh, have uh, um, looked at the heart in different ways and uh, these are a couple of images uh, which were painted by Edvard Munch <coughs> from Norway and uh, they are in the um, Munch Museum in Oslo. Um, Munch uh, uh, was uh, quite depressed, uh, uh, his mother died when he was about five years old and you can see on the left uh, the uh, uh, the, the uh, agitation um, and the despair uh, uh, of his loneliness. And uh, in the background, you can see uh, two men on the bridge uh, which uh, were moving away from him. So he felt the isolation very much. And on the right-hand side, um, again, he's uh, touching the heart, he's feeling the pain. And you can also see the uh, shadow of the woman in front of him uh, with a heart shape. Um, uh, back uh, uh, and uh, uh, he clearly um, related the heart to emotion, uh, maybe sadness, depression, and so on. 
Uh, as uh, many of you know, I come from uh, the small island of Malta and in the bottom left, uh, there is uh, the picture of the very uh, uh, elaborate uh, St. John's Cathedral. And in it, there is this very famous painting by Caravaggio, the beheading of St. John. And you can see the lady uh, clutching her face. And uh, I wonder whether Munch uh, had some uh, idea when he uh, painted the scream uh, uh, some 200 years later, having seen uh, this picture uh, first. So uh, in conclusion, uh, keep stimulated into innovation, both with the heart and in life. And thank you for uh, listening. And uh, thank you for the invitation to give this very important lecture about a very good old friend whom we miss very much. Thank you.